All right. Welcome back to Shop Class Podcast. This is bonus round and the same night, but we're going to get an update from uh, Matt Boomquist, Build, Learn, Teach. He's going to give us an update on his, on building the house. You got to understand if you haven't caught up with this, there's high school and then there's what Matt does, which is he teaches kids how to actually build a house ground up. They get the land, they dig it out. And they're using all the new equipment they're doing. They're doing the uh, uh, the T stud, the, the thermal break. They're doing the uh, the you know rock wool. But Matt could tell us more about it. I'm so excited to see the you know the progress. It's very cool. Yeah. So I'll give you guys a quick update. Um, obviously, if anybody's following along on Instagram, I'm kind of keeping people posted. Um, of course, we've been doing things to help with Mark Willie, who's hanging out with us again tonight. Uh, we, we got T studs on the site. Um, I'll show, I'll, I'll share my screen so I can share some photos and stuff here real mm -hmm. fast. Um, hope I do this one, right? It's that big arrow right there. Yeah. I was making there sure I go. share the right thing, whether it's a tab or a window. All right. So mm -hmm. I pulled up the Google folder photos. Um, so let's see if i can find a picture you're gonna see some family picture stuff here too but um okay here's a good close-up um so our walls we we've got them all the exterior walls are all standing up um we uh obviously like i said we're using the t-stud so what you guys can see there is that gap in between there uh that is our thermal break so that means insulation will fall in between there and there's a space so that means no heat transfer is happening um, or very, very minimal heat transfers happening, which is good when we're trying to build higher performing houses. Uh, also, if we go back a picture here, we tie that in with uh, our air sealing details. Um, so what you see here is um, another one of our Canadian friends at 475 Supply, uh, Sean. Uh, Mark knows Sean very well. Um, got us hooked up with um, the... Oh, I can't think of his name. He was actually over in, in New York. But uh, anyways, they, they gave us a nice discount on their Contiga um, caulking, acoustical sealant. I believe, I think it's acoustical sealant. Anyways, that caulking is like the stickiest gum you'll ever deal with, and it just stays that way. Uh, it kind of skims over, but it's still sticky. Um, pretty cool. So anyways, this is an air sealing detail that uh, it's gotten very popular thanks to Jake Bruton and Steve Basic, who Steve jumped on that one time with Mark also and talked with us and stuff. So we did this detail on the last house. So that's how we air seal our framing to our, our, uh, foundation. Now wait, let me, is just... there any, oh, is there right, any sealant right. underneath the foam? Yep. So it's hard to see. So there's a continuous bead under the foam and then a continuous bead on top. Now, ideally, I, uh, you want it more in a Z pattern where the kids in this photo, it's a little bit more in the center. So that way you don't get like a teetering effect um on it but ideally you want like a sealant say on the inside underneath and on the outside on top or vice versa um but yeah it's it makes a z pattern so that way connecting you know anytime you're connecting two things to another you know especially different surfaces wood to concrete it's never perfect so that picks up those imperfections uh and f forgive me the beginner in the room i have no idea about building houses is this the normal process uh, like putting the foam underneath the, the bottom of this flag. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Still the, the, the foam gasket is called sill seal, which is pretty standard. I would say I'm across the nation. Probably I'm guessing because what it, what that does originally, um, it wasn't so much the air barrier and stuff. It was more the, uh, the capillary break between concrete to concrete to uh, wood. So you got to have a cap capillary break so that way um cuz you know there's moisture in concrete and if the wood's dry on there it's just going to suck it right up right so um yeah it that's pretty standard practice adding that caulking is what uh does the air sealing detail so you're you're this is you know 2.0 when it comes this to that it right here stuff. here's a piece yep oh okay yep. oh it's pretty thin I yeah. use it. I use it for uh, packaging material. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, because it's, it's pretty good for packaging. So it's real thin. It's good to wrap stuff in. But yeah, it's that sill, sill seal. Yep. So that's it. And, and it's like ribbed. It's also ribbed. So, which is pretty neat too. So, and it's actually and pretty the, uh, strong. Like, I mean, it, it tears, but it's not, it's, it's not like tearing paper. You got to give it a pretty good tug to rip it. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty durable stuff. But like I said, it's, it's more used as a capillary break. But when you combine it with these caulking details, now you have an air sealing detail as well. So, so the, so the difference would be that you're adding this caulk and this caulk happens to be a high quality, right? Very high quality. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is some Sorry good stuff. This is the beginner, beginner questions here. Yeah. No, good questions. Yep. Hey, so, Steve basics here. This is like perfect timing. Uh, are you serious? <laughs> I'm serious. I, I just oh, texted it. You would classify this stuff, Ron, as, as elastomeric and it stays elastomeric. And Steve will, Steve will cut us off all the time. And, and I also texted uh, Sean, Matt. Oh, nice. Yeah. Hey, Steve. You're on there. Yeah. We were just uh, showing off. We're doing a little show and tell and stuff, showing off some details of the house, which, by the way, the floor plan we are using was given to us by Steve Basic, uh, architect over uh, out in near Boston, Massachusetts. So, um, What's yeah, up, Sean awesome. Class? So, so Ron, you got to hire Mark as a producer. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt. Mark's talent, amazing. talent finder. That's what Mark is. Oh, Mark yeah, for the win. <laughs> this whole this whole thing's been expansive, and it's just we just keep going, and every week it gets better. It's like amazing, you know. I appreciate you joining, Steve and Mark, and everybody. Oh, else. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, all right. So Matt, what? So this is the beginning right here, the T stud. Oh, by the way, from the Instagram, I I didn't realize that you actually fill the T stud with the foam. You fill it, so, right? Yeah, I, I that's the headers, and you can. So depending on what you're um, insulating your walls with, what we'll do is we'll use blown in cellulose. Um, here, here's actually here's a picture of the the kids doing this detail. But we'll we'll do blown in cellulose. The cellulose will dense pack inside there and fall inside. But you could also do a spray foam. That'll do it. And I'll show you the headers that we spray foamed. Um, but yeah, here's that detail. Here's the first layer, and then throw down a seal seal and do the second one. Like I said, ideally we'd like to stay kind of more towards the edges, um, just so you don't get a teetering effect uh, on there. But you can see you can kind of see where it gets darker um, in the underneath there that's where we like we smush down that seal seal into and it spreads out pretty good so and, and we kind of even got to test it out because it rained on us all week last week and water did not run out down the side of the foundation it just stayed on the concrete we had to push it down into the uh, middle part where our sub pump is hey hey matt can you plug those fancy caulk guns that don't make your forearms tired and and can we get a zoom in on steven basic's hat um i'd have to stop presenting for you get the zoom in um and you'd have to talk i think here hold on I'll, i am an architect oh so so steven's got to talk in order to get the window on there yeah hold on let so, me do i have to stop presenting so we can see Z steve's hat real quick no, we'll, uh yeah yeah okay here i'll stop sharing and, and real quick. he's got to say something okay say Otherwise, something hey, there you go can you read it nice it I'm an architect, not an effing magician <laughs> <laughs> I'm an architect, not a magician. I don't know how to get the recording to do all of it. It's only who's speaking who gets the – it's the blue square that goes around the person's uh, 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 video, and that's who's being recorded at the moment. Like, I'm being recorded right now. Anyway, it's some technical details about the podcast. Uh, but can I modify that that hat for, like, everything, like teaching and for – Right. For also Seriously. The that would work for everybody on the show right now. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, so in the picture there, we got Caleb running the uh, Milwaukee, uh, I think it's the M18 or whatever, uh, battery powered caulk gun or M12. I, for, I forget what battery it takes. But uh, yeah, you just pull the trigger, set the dial and go. And it's uh, when you're doing, you know, 100 linear feet about three or four times around the house. Uh, actually 100 plus linear feet actually i think actually we're talking 200 linear feet 
uh, it makes quick work of it. Uh, yeah, and your arm, forearms aren't burning by the end of it. So the, some of the guys got gave me a little grief about that. But you know what's funny with that? Uh, everybody was fighting over to run the, the caulk gun, which is a not glamorous, it's not anything special job. But when you're trying to air seal and you want to make sure you got a good continuous speed, well, now that that job becomes really important and everybody was super excited to do it. So they're fighting over the job that most time you just give to the low man on a totem pole. So um, I thought that was kind of cool using a little bit of new technology to make make the job more cool to the kids. Um, hey, Matt, yeah. when you take your finger off the trigger, does it stop extruding? Yep. And it sucks back. It stops and it sucks back. So you, you don't have like the run out. That was a good question. It's easy. It's got it. so easy. <laughs> right. So easy. So easy. So um, one of the things Ron was talking about was uh, pictures of this picture right here where you see these T-studs and they have the foam inside of them. Uh, now, Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you guys are officially have these for sale now, like on the market, the insulated T-studs or headers. That, that You know, they're available, oh. but the thing is um, – most people that are figuring out their framing will acquaint for their own headers. And so what you're about to show, the process that that you all put together to do it yourself, I think that's going to be the predominant way of doing for the carpenter contractor to, to do them the way you've done them with the students. Gotcha. Yeah. So what we did was um... – to have an insulated head, headers are kind of always, you know, pe we, I swear probably in even the amount of time I've been in construction, I've probably built, I don't know how many different versions of headers. Cause you're always trying to figure out the best insulated along with making sure you are strong enough, which on smaller, you know, most time on smaller windows, we probably overbuilt more often than we, un well, obviously we didn't underbuild, but we probably overbuilt more often. And then usually that translated into less insulation in those spots. Uh, so using the T studs, it really solves a lot of issues and it's really simple. In fact, Mark jumped on the phone and we did a little thing real quick, a little FaceTime video uh, with the kids um, because you still have to have some nailing patterns and make sure you secure all these things because they, they are structural, right? Even if they're small or big. So uh, the kids, you know, took, uh, we got Milwaukee impact guns and some GRK screws just for some product plugs there. Uh, we had cut our T studs down to you cut two T or two pieces of T studs down to your length of your header, um, screw them together in a specified pattern per T stud specs, and then we uh, hold on, we skipped a step there. Then what we did was we took once we got them screwed together, we we had some leftover leftover stagel wrap, which was uh, the moisture barrier we used underneath our concrete, and we just had some cutoffs that I just. I luckily didn't have the kids throw away and we just uh tack stapled those on real quick just to when we spray foam in to hold everything inside and then we took the spray foam guns and just used some big gap filler um the the orange you see is just because the the lumber yard what they had left over was the fire rated so that's the only reason they're orange so some of these actually have some fire rating. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, they went through, sprayed those up. And what we found is if we sprayed right up to the, the top dowels there and not overfilled it, the expansion wasn't too crazy. Um, we just slapped a piece of plastic back over the top of them. We let them sit and dry or cure, I should say. We let them cure. And the next day, we had these very satisfying videos and pictures of them just taking a metal sawzall blade laying it flat across the t-stud header and slicing off the foam like uh scraping off um frosting on a cake or something and uh the finished product was probably about as good as it looks coming out of the factory and uh so there they were and then we even I don't know if I have the picture on here. I did post it on Instagram today. Um, I could probably find you to show it through Instagram, but um, we we had a double stacked one because we have a wider window. Oh, here we go. Here is the mega 
mega header. And all, all those pieces are actually screwed and connected all together. Um, so that is one solid cohesive thing. And like I said, wow. uh, the foam goes all the way through. It worked out great and uh, got them installed. So we are good to go, waiting for our sheeting to show up uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, and you can kind of see there's the building. The trusses are the trusses showed up this week, so they're ready to go once we get sheeting and bracing and the wall stringed. Uh, so we're back there. And then today we had a fun guest. We had won a free lunch with uh, Fast and Masters, which uh, they they're a big producer of structural screws. And one header that we did build that uh, you guys can see right here. I won't play this one because it has a video to it. So maybe I don't know if it'll do the sound. But anyways, uh, we use those structural screws, screws to make the big old header that goes over top of our uh, garage door. Um, here is TJ here presenting. They brought the kids lunch. We brought all of them out. They had a good time playing with all the cool uh, ledger screws they have a tip for. The, awesome. uh, what else? I don't know. They got big old eight inch long timber timber screws and timber locks and flat locks and all different kinds of stuff uh the kids really got to participate with a hands-on experience so that was awesome that fast and master did that plus left us plenty of product to have on hand and uh yeah it was a good time it was it, it was fun it was a good experience for the kids uh they they enjoyed it and so yeah oh and then the last house is sold so house 27 so is sold. A, this is a house from last year, right? Yep. This is one we've showed and toured on here and stuff. Oh, and this then was like in the, the, in the, you had the virtual tour for this one, right? Yep. Yep. This is, this one's sold and I no longer own the keys too. So it's kind of nice. So we're on the house 28 and things are going pretty well. We got some exciting, fun things. We'll, um, that Steve's kind of helped out with and Mark's helped out with, with their connections. Um, we got a lot of companies involved that uh so, some helped out with the last health some some are new companies that were getting involved and stuff and uh yeah steve's given us a uh house plan that's gonna work really well for obviously efficiency and performance wise and using all the details that him and his uh other very talented building science friends have put together and shared with the community and shared with us and the kids are knocking out of the ballpark. So, like I said, uh, we have uh, this is one of Steve's big things too. You know, like once you do something, you gotta go and do it better, right? Learn the process and improve upon it. So, we got to be the best house on the block. And some some overconfident teacher down the road just built a super well built, pretty good house. Hashtag pretty good house down the road. So we got to beat that, those guys. Um, on this one so i told the kids you got to beat yourself on you got to beat yourself you got to beat me and the other students and stuff so we gotta we you know where we finished off with a point nine we we're under we we're under one on the h50 on the blower door test so we're gonna keep shooting to have the last final one at the passive house standard on air air exchanges hopefully and stuff so uh wait like i said we're yeah it, I, that, that house 27 should be the worst house I ever built in this program. Whoa, that's a cool statement. I like that. Yeah. So, so, okay. Just to slow down and, and help out the beginners in the room, like me and maybe some audience members or whatever. Uh, so the goal is to make it more uh, energy efficient with the help of uh, new products, new techniques, uh, new plans from Steve basic and from, you know, Mark and, and from T stud and stuff like that. Um, and is, is this current house the, uh, a design from Steve? Yeah. So the, the one we sold was my, I, I came up with the plan and stuff by the time I got connected with Steve and stuff, we were kind of too late in the game. Um, but like I said, luckily Steve and his other colleagues and stuff have all were jumped on board right away with us. Um, Oh, see you, Andrew. Thanks, man. No problem, Andrew. See you later. Good, good luck on the Harbor Freight thing. Um, so, so that one was a design on on our end. Um, Steve was kind enough. Uh, like I said, he's 
portfolio is very broad and he had plenty of options that we could pick from that would fit in a city lot like what we have um and we we kind of voted on i i had like you know teachers and kids and stuff kind of vote on the house design and uh this is kind of what they they liked and mark hooked us up with uh, some connections with getting windows that are going to be awesome um so yeah steve steve gave us the floor plan he didn't have to do a full architect service for us um so you know i, I pretty much took the outside design as far as picking out like siding and things like that you know i mean it was steve's plan and design the floor plan is all steve's um and uh the foundation which i'll start talking about here very soon a little bit more in depth on on instagram and stuff was something him and jake bruton did uh which is a hybrid foundation um nice thing for us it allows us to have a crawl space even though it's on a slab and our insulation details and stuff with what we'll do for that uh us having a crawl space in where we live is acts as a storm shelter as well so um that design of having every all the plumbing pretty much down the middle so all the plumbing is accessible the um and in fact we, we i made it a little bit wider down there so actually storage you, you could use this as your storage because by the time you pump all the insulation up in the attic there's there's no attics aren't for storage anymore they're if you're if you're doing your attic right you, you don't you should you're not going to go up there anymore anyway so mm. but the crawl space is uh if you listen to steve and jake's podcast unbuild it podcast uh they just launched one talking about if the crawl space is inside or outside the house ours is definitely inside the house so we treat it pretty much like it would if it's a basement where do i find that podcast uh anywhere i, I listen through it through google so you can go any podcast service i believe and find it it's unbuild it podcast where all podcasts are found. Hey, yeah. hey, Ron, if you start at IG, right, because you had that up on your website, just type yeah. in Unbuild It Podcast, and Steve's handsome mug will pop up, followed by Peter's and Jake's. Yeah, we're, we're on YouTube, too, so you can actually oh, yeah. watch the podcast. So that way you get to like, see the behind-the-scenes antics and stuff. So it's the Unbuild It show on YouTube. Got it. There it is. There it is. Crawl space. To 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 bring it to another level, Ron. Uh, I know of a guy uh, 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 that was a Marine that actually has the logo on his shoes, right? So w when you talk the talk, that's one thing, but when you turn around and walk the walk with your shoes, I don't know who that person is, but it'd be great to have him on your program. Oh my, God. <laughs> oh my god there we go okay wait a minute the only way to get that is if steve steve tell us about it so we hear the sound and it'll record you oh wait, there, you go. there you go god tell us what that is that is my newest pair of chuck taylor's but it's got the unbuild it logo on it that's awesome and did you put that on there? No, my wife got them for me as a uh, birthday present. Oh, so she had them cool. made for me. Are they steel toe? No, they're not steel toe. He, he, he's an architect. He doesn't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, by the time I get out there, things are good. Here, that's a that's a shot where you can actually read it there. So, but yeah, this it's my that's latest awesome. pair. Very classy. When your when your wife buys you a pair of custom shoes with your logo on it, that's when you know the dedication is <laughs> is is foremost. I, I I'm looking at Nick for the first time ever. He's not in that special screen share moment. He's like, holy crap! When am I getting my shoes? <laughs> He's actually up moving. <laughs> uh, let's check out let's check out the YouTube channel. What? Yo. No. Yeah. I want to subscribe for sure. So the, the cool thing about the YouTube channel is we, we post our videos um, of the of the actual podcast every other week. So we do two a month, but in between we post a lot of supporting data. So Jake is a uh, 
premier builder in the country, does a lot of good stuff. I do a lot of work with him down in Missouri. Um, and then there's myself, and then there's a gentleman, Peter Yost, who is one of the more noted building scientists in the country. There's the three of us. Uh, and uh, so the, the cool thing about the podcast is you get the builder, the architect, and the building scientist. And, you know, Jake and I do a lot of our work up front, obviously designing and building new buildings. A lot of Peter's work um, is coming in after the fact when buildings fail and trying to diagnose why they failed. I, I met Peter. We both worked at Building Science Corporation together for a long time. I've, I've known Peter, I don't know, 20 some odd years. So he's he wears his uh, wingnut hat and, uh, you know, he, he calls it the wingnut test facility, WTF. But basically, he loves to go into his basement and tinker and ask questions about why does this happen? Why does that happen? And then he goes down there and plays with his toys and diagnostic equipment and tries to figure out what's actually happening there. So his legitimacy is at an all time high in the industry for, uh, you know, there's the, the three of us. But, uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun. We get along very, very well. And uh, we... Uh, you know, come down on each other through the uh, podcast, but there's always really good tidbits of uh, information between the three of us. I don't know. You got probably 80 plus years of experience. And, and Peter so, used to be a high school science teacher. Yeah. And a builder. And I worked as a builder and electrician before I went to architecture school. So it, interesting yeah, tidbit about Peter, because uh, most people classify in the industry, when you need a detail, you go to Stephen Basic because he, he created the architectural drawings that we still uh, use today. And S Stephen's go-to person when he has a question is Peter Yost. So yeah. if you ever have a question, make sure you ask Peter on Instagram because he will never answer you. He's about as anti-social media as they come. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, he's uh, he's he's a wealth of knowledge. And when I have to talk things through, he's usually the guy I call. And uh, is it like this? Um, yeah, he's building right, Peter. Ah. Uh, he he probably has zero posts, and I'm surprised he has 2,100 followers. And the post we we had him posting, and he was doing it for a little bit, and then he had somebody doing it for him. Ah, so, and then they, they stopped. And so, but oh, you can see on his post there, Peter and I would pre COVID, we would travel the country and probably between the two of us do close to a hundred seminars, um, wow. a year talking. We, we have a thing called the home building crossroads that both him and I travel around the country. And it's a day long seminar where we pop into a city and uh, we sit there and we talk all building science for a day with the building community. And, uh, you know, Mark and Matt and all these guys have uh, been through it. And I'm learning something just looking at this post. Oh yeah. He's uh, he's a wealth of knowledge for sure. Because there's, you can see where there's the heat areas. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a IR camera. Oh, yeah, you can see where the house is insulated and where it isn't. That is cool. So, 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 Ron, when Peter poses a question, people jump just to answer because they want to, you know, hear that they have the answer. And he knows what they're going to answer because he's traveled the country asking the question. And so people fall into the moat and they fall into the moat and they fall into the moat. And it's not until a couple of people fall where the drawbridge is lowered down and then you get revealed, hey, it's not about spitting out the answer. It's about discovering what questions you need to ask because the problem is greater than your spitfire version, right? Uh, amazing, amazing guy. Um, beyond words, what he can deliver in a in a presentation where everyone in the room is stumped you could have 400 professionals 
and they're all stumped, and he's smiling because he knows it's going to happen. And there's Stephen ready with a sweatshirt or a set of golf balls to chuck them up your head at your head if you have the right answer as a reward. And uh, they play with the crowd because they want you to think. It's not about it's not about responding. It's about thinking through the variables. And uh, that the, the answer is always ask more questions. Yeah, we're 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 firm believers in that that whole adage about. You know, we, we get a lot of people that come to the seminars and say, hey, I'm building a house. How do I do this? And it's like, you know, yeah, there's Peter with his wing nut hat. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Peter and I both have this belief that you really need to understand the science and what you're doing. And then you can solve your own problems. But, you know, we're our, our culture most of the time just wants the solution, not the process. And that's just very dangerous. And so Peter's got this awesome uh, uh, presentation that we usually finish the day with called Building Science Puzzles. So he'll put up a slide and give a couple words about, hey, this is what's going on here and how it's failing. What do you think? And people can't get it. And then he'll put up slide number two, which digs a little deeper into the problem. And then by like slide four, people are now starting to understand and, and coming around with the questions, the right questions, hmm. you know, but that's, that's, what's important for, you know, the stuff that, you know, to circle back and what Matt is doing is getting these kids. It's not teaching them how to build a house. It's teaching them how a house operates and, and how it functions and what are the components that control certain, you know, if, if you think about it for a house to operate, properly let's just say there's you know i don't know 300 levers that have to operate and in, in kind of a certain synchronization right so how do you understand how do you um put those levers or position those levers so that you get that proper operation and that's what you know matt is teaching these kids it's not i mean you know nailing a two by four and creating the headers is is a cool thing and all but understanding the concept of a thermal break is where the money's at. I, I think it's great what you're saying. You know, um, as a shop teacher, the, I have a funny joke, especially in the current situation in the country. I ask the kids, do you guys believe in science? And they all say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, no, 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 no. Science is not belief. Science is evidence-based. You want to understand what it is. You need to control a variable. Maybe uh, you're creating a new solution, you know, but it's not just like, oh, as someone said some numbers and I'm just going to believe them. Don't believe anyone. You should verify the whole thing. And the only way to verify it is, I would go back to you and say, is the process. If you know the, if you learn the right questions and the right process, then you won't need someone to tell you the answers. You're going to verify it yourself. Yeah. And, and to expand on that, you know, speaking from 30 years of experience in building, every time I figure out something, all I've really come to understand is what I didn't know about that process. And now I've, I've, I've shut one door, but opened 10 more that I now have to search out and find out what's going on at that, just at that deeper level. So I always tell people, you know, we're, we're, we're all on a learning curve. We're just in different seats. Yeah. Verify it. Absolutely. Now, just to bring it back for a second on, you know, I'm new to this and everything. I, I, I understand the T stud situation with the with thermal break, but no idea is, is wood wood would transfer energy more than a foam would and and this might for you guys be obvious and that's but i wouldn't even know you know it doesn't matter what the material is all materials have different conductive rates right so obviously you're not going to you know you don't make metal, uh, mittens out of steel you make them out of cloth and the reason is is because cloth doesn't conduct heat like steel would Okay. Right. So if you if you had steel mittens, it would suck the heat out of your hands and you'd be freezing in, in minutes. But the cloth and you know, and plus it 
Plus there's the air that it encapsulates around the hand that also insulates and um, those things. But yeah, the short answer to your question is, every, and everything has a thermal value. Some things just really suck at it, like glass, and some things are very good at it, like foam or insulation, right? Mm -hmm. Or vacuum packed, uh, they, they have this like vacuum sealed material that you can get like r15 out of a half inch or something it's crazy um but it's just crazy expensive so we don't use it mm. um, but but yeah everything every, and that's that's you know getting back to what you said that's the process right it's not understanding insulation good wood bad or steel bad it's understanding that everything has a thermal value and everything is a conductor some things just conduct heat faster it's it's like what would you rather sit on in february in minneapolis a wood bench or a concrete bench probably the wood mm. because it the it, you're going to lose heat much slower you know it's funny you mentioned the vacuum seal um you know <laughs> this is going to sound kind of funny or naive or whatever but i didn't realize that outer space actually does not have anything in other words when you're explaining like a vacuum thermal, like a thermal, um, uh, uh, you know, a thermos and it has a double wall. And the reason that from my understanding, finally, is that the reason why there's not much transfer, like why it's still steaming hot eight hours later is not just because it has better insulation is that there's no, there's, nothing there. there's, there's no, there's no transfer. Yeah which was mind blowing to me. And then my friend was explaining, it's just like outer space. There's no transfer because there's nothing out there. Yep. There's nothing to conduct the, the, the waves. Yeah. You know, uh, Ron, the words you use are, are all the words of building science, right? So you have radiant, right? It's everything that radiates from the sun. You have convection, you have conduction. And when Steve's talking about these materials, when he mentions the, the steel and the cotton, it's perfect, right? So when we're holding an aluminum can, right, what does that aluminum can feel like? Put a cozy on it. Put a sock on it. Yeah. Put, 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 a, put a bunch of, you know, whatever on it. It will be different, right? And so, like... For people that have this mind-blowing experience with how the building's performing, it's only because we haven't talked about it. You naturally had the answer to everything Steve said, who pretty much wrote the book on building science, right? Like, it just shows you inherently humans know, but we have to teach it. We have to share it. And it is, it's, it's all around us, right? It's why are coffee cups made out of styrofoam and not glass? Or why are they not made out of metal, right? It's not because styrofoam is cheap. It's styrofoam provides some insulating um, to keep the coffee warm, but also to give us the ability to hold it in our hand comfortably. So it's a comfort thing as well as a thermal efficiency thing. Right. That's amazing. What, again, that's what Matt is teaching these kids. It's that, you know, when, when they can equate zip R sheathing to why a coffee cup is made out of EPS, then they've understood the process of science. Mm. This is so cool. I, you know, and um, now, Matt, the last house, you have a number on that. You know the efficiency of the house. Is that how it comes down to just, to just a number or no? Kind of. Like we, 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 with a blower door test kit, we, we can test the, uh, the, our air ceiling, you know, how, 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 what our air, air leakage is. So we have those kinds of numbers. Um, obviously, you could break down the wall. Steve can explain that or has explained that better in some like articles and stuff. Um, you know, the actual uh, R value of the wall, because yes, in the cavities where there's insulation, that's where you have the most R value, but then your studs, you know, you lose so much, you lose some at the windows, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so we can measure that. And then, you know, they, these guys know enough stuff from, you know, the houses and case studies and stuff where they, you know, know if we have this kind of, this much air ceiling and this much insulation, 
you know, how certain things are going to perform or what they're going to need, you know, maybe for heating, cooling loads and things like that. Um, but I, I don't have like a number uh, that says this is what the, our house does. Now, of course, there's, you know, you can get certifications like passive house certifications and there's HERS ratings and things like that that kind of start putting numbers on it. Steve could probably explain that a little bit better. But uh, yeah, to say my house is like a five or something, I, I don't have like a number like that. I can just tell you things that, you know, benchmarks that we hit with uh, the processes or materials um, or the wall. So you probably have a HERS rating, no? Don't you have a HERS rating for your? Uh... Uh, no, we didn't. We didn't do oh, one. No. I, I don't even know around here how to even go about getting one and how that all works even. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, you know, and I'm sure it's like that in almost any industry but it's it's really interesting in the building industry like i said i you know i i've come up through working with some people that are the best at what they do in the industry and i was very fortunate for it and but i'm kind of somewhat swayed into their views too right meaning that there there's a couple courses when you look at the building industry there's a lot of people that think we should build these extreme buildings. But the problem with that is, is you know, we pull 1.3 million building permits a year for new houses, and we build 100 or 150 of these extreme houses that have, you know, literally no energy bills and this and that. When we can do something that Matt is doing, if we put an army of students out there and everything they build is 15% or 20% better, mm. then that 15 or 20% hits over a million of those building permits, not 150, right? So it's like you could sit there and we can build a car that gets 300 miles to the gallon. But if we only sell 100 of them a year, what the hell good is it? Yeah. But if we could take the car industry and get everybody operating at 60 miles to a gallon, then we're doing something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, a, I'm an electric car fan and advocate, and I've done some electric car stuff, but I've always said that if the car companies want to, you know, catch or, or even put a, a moat or elbows out on, on a Tesla type car, all they got to do is improve the gas mileage. Now, it seems easy when I say it, but there are things that Formula One does. There's, you know, you can have a electric turbo. You can have, you can capture some of the heat that you get rid of. There's ways of improving it. Um, and, and, and then if you had like a, like a gas mileage that went up, uh, that would be very practical for, uh, for, for across the board. Well, and, and not, not trying to sound like a fatalist, but whether you're dealing with the automobile industry or the building industry, there's a, a lot of people that are in that industry that, you know, their, their thoughts are, are with bad ideas because those bad ideas make them lots of money. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. You know, well, Chevron, Chevron and BP aren't getting behind the electric car. Now they say they are, yeah, yeah. But it's not in their interest. Of course not. And and you know what? And I I, I don't blame them. If I were if, if all if my entire family income, my whole thing came from oil, it'd be very difficult to shift gears. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it would be like, you know, Dunkin Donuts is not going to sell like a uh, 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 salads, you know. But here I I'll, I'll, I'll give you this <laughs> analogy that I use a lot. You know, I'm I'm not that old, but let's just say in the last 30 years, the modes upon which I've listened to music, it's probably six or seven, right? From a track, vinyl, a track, cassette, CD, iPod, all this now to my phone, right? Mm -hmm. In 30 years, the car has been out for what almost a hundred years with the combustion engine, and we haven't had one ounce of efficiency over that hundred years. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's something wrong there. <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the same with our housing. I mean, our housing is getting better and better, but we we certainly know how to build better. We choose not to. Interesting. Very interesting. And that's probably true of the car industry if we dug deep enough, I'm sure. 
and I'm sure it's probably true of every industry, but there's interests in things not changing. Yeah, for sure. And and even on like a very simple example, you know, just a, just a few what a decade ago they came out with the Hummer for, you know, cons for public consumption. You know, now that's I'm not saying don't drive a Hummer, go ahead, but uh, you know, for commuters to have a, a vehicle that looks like a Hummer and they don't even offer anything better. You know, there's no efficient, super fit, like a hundred mile to the gallon pickup truck. That would be interesting. Well, the Hummer was built for the U S military. So that right there, I'll tell you something. Yeah. So. You, you know, Ron, I, I actually figured something out for Hummer. Uh, they wanted, they wanted someone, someone really brilliant to figure out where Hummers went. And I, 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 I calculated this for, for Hummer, and uh, the, the answer was the fuel station. <laughs> Mark, oh, yeah. I don't know if I ever told you, but I drove one of the first Hummers ever. Um, oh. When I, I was in the Marine Corps, I was in the Marine Corps from 84 to 88, and I was stationed out at, uh, in California at Camp Pendleton in a, in a motor pool. That was our job. And I remember when they brought the first one out and gave it to us and said, hey, guys, just go and beat on this for a week and tell us what you think. No and kidding. Wow. We, we took it all. We took it out. It's not as fun as the little Jeep. The Jeep is still one of my favorites because that thing will go cool. anywhere. The, the Willys. I, I know we're recording, but I would love to hear what what you did to that Hummer, right? Because oh, yeah. like... we, we got photos. I got photos somewhere of that thing buried in mud, getting pulled out by tow trucks. And <laughs> that's awesome. We we definitely put it through the test. I I don't know if this audience knows and. You might want to share if Ron's open to it, but uh, some of the people you drove with in the Marines is an epic, epic story. <laughs> yeah, yeah so I, I tell everybody, you know, I was, I was very fortunate. I, I drove Secretary of Defense, Attorney General of the United States, wow. Secretary of the Navy. In, in those days, probably, you know, any three or four star Admiral General, they, they came across my car. Probably. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. So I used to play golf with them. I, yeah, I had quite, I have tons of stories. I could, I could sit here and bore you all day. I got, I got a tour of Air Force One. Oh, wow. Um, with uh, Mike Mansfield, who was, uh, he was ambassador to Japan at the time. So former, no uh, former senator, I think of Montana. But the coolest thing was one of the stories he told me. He lied to get into the army at age 15 to fight in World War One. Whoa. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have that. I have another story where I, you know, you always see the flag raising, um, the photo that Mark uh, Rosenthal took on Iwo Jima. So I actually sat down and had a chat with a guy that watched the flag go up and watched. Joe Rosenthal take the photo. Whoa, so, that's amazing. That's uh, amazing. A lot of yeah, people, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I get to meet a, a lot of people and what I've done and and still do. That's cool. You know? So yeah. How, how did you switch gears into the building trades? Was that something on the horizon the whole time? Or no, actually, I I came out of the Marine Corps to go to school to go back in the Marine Corps and fly jets, which is still probably my number one choice but uh i met this beautiful woman and uh made a right turn and went to architecture school <laughs> wow that's interesting that's cool so but that's uh, great but yeah yep. it was uh but you know what the military when 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 you're working at that level it's no different than working for like ford or ibm and all the ceos there i mean the military is just a big company right Right. right. I mean, the, the idea of leadership and the people in charge and how stuff goes downhill, all that's the same. So the, the, the beauty of the Marine Corps and working with people like that was epic in my life because, for example, the, the, the four-star admiral, I used to play golf with him quite often. I'd, I would be the fourth. If somebody dropped out, they would. I, I had like a, at the time, probably a three or four handicap. So I could, I could hold my own and uh, they would use me to fill in. And, but 
you know, this is the, I don't know, he was probably the second highest military guy in the, in the U.S. military at the time. And you're riding around in a golf cart with him for four hours. You're going to learn something. Yeah. Right? He, he, he's going to, he's going to rub off on you some ideas on what it means to be successful. How do you position yourself for success? How do you think it's, it's that same thing. Like you were talking about the process, right? Mm. It's, it's understanding when you talk about leaders and, and all of that, then, you know, if you saw my post on Instagram, I talked about that tonight. I did one that said, look at, if you want to be successful, find somebody that's successful and just do what they do. It's not that hard. It's not, there's, there's no big secret in how to be successful. The, the secret is you have to have a little discipline, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the key. We all know how to be successful. We all know what we should do, but it's a question of what do we do? Yeah. Is it this you one? Know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean that's, 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 that's exactly how I met you, Steve. He's one of the I, smartest indeed. guys I know in the building industry, Brian. And, uh, and he still, he gets people to come out to the job site and he wants to chat with them. Because he wants to make sure he knows everything about that product that he's using. He doesn't, he doesn't take anything for granted. He doesn't assume anything. He says, if I'm going to use SEGA tape and I'm going to use this weather-resistive barrier by SEGA, then I'm going to have the SEGA guys come out and tell me all about their product. And I'm going to ask them questions. And we're going to get on the same page. You know? And, and Brian is, that's why Brian's a smart guy. Because he freaking questions and he listens and there's a lot of people in our world especially in, on instagram that want to get out there and just preach and talk about things like they know all the answers and they don't they don't they know enough information to get them in trouble that's what they know yeah you know that's awesome so, so yeah be like brian so you can be like brian you can be a oh, smart really guy that's very humble but knows a lot of shit yeah why not talk to the manufacturing rep and find out you know more about the product don't just buy it i mean sure yeah, you open the box and assume you know how to how to put it together yeah i mean sure you could buy it in a pinch but eventually you should know something more about it yeah yeah that's good and again that's a, a you know matt and, and his students you get out there you put this stuff together you have that conversation about what it is that you're doing and and how are you doing it and why are you doing it you know because matt could just go out there and say hey grab that cock gun and run this beat of cock down here like this yeah and be done and right. there's unfortunately there's a lot of builders that do that to their you know newer employers employees and just say, hey, just run this beat of cock down here. Well, that employee doesn't have a clue on why he's doing it. He doesn't know that, like, the thickness of that bead matters, the continuity of that bead matters, that what, what are the things, the important characteristics of putting that bead of sealant down? And and again, you know, we we, we know what we should be doing. It's we, We've got to be able to transfer that information, you know. I, I had this other post in there um, a while back that Joe Stebrick from Building Science Corporation taught me. It's, you know, information. We're not, we're not necessarily, the, the idea is never mine, right? All of our ideas come from somewhere, someone previous to us, and we're going to leave that idea with somebody else that they're going to build on it. So, it, it makes us more of curators of information than it is kind of, you know, information storage places. Like we don't have knowledge. We process knowledge and pass it on, or at least that's what we should do. I agree. I, you know, I agree about the passing on. I, you know, the kids in my class, they're always asking me questions like, you know, how do you get rich? You know, like, you know, and I say to them, just figure out how to help more people more often. And part of that is passing on knowledge. If you could just be helpful. I mean, you're, you don't want to be the richest guy in the graveyard. That's useless. Right. You know? But there is, you know, knowledge is power. Knowledge gets you. Because knowledge is also, it's like, uh, it's like being a really good young athlete. If, if you have, if you're a good young athlete, then you get on better teams, you get better coaches, you get better 
um, opponents and it makes you a better athlete in turn. So mm -hmm. if you have, if you work towards having a decent um, curator of knowledge, then you're going to meet like-minded people that are going to give you more information for you to take up. And then you're going to meet even smarter people that are going to give you more information. So you're going to, you're going to build on that. And that's how you become successful. I think. Yeah, that's interesting. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I've gained a lot from this from watching Matt and, you know, I, I'm like a car guy, but I, I, I think the house thing is interesting. I really know nothing about it. And I've watched Matt. But they're all parallel courses, right? I mean, fixing a car and building a house or diagnosing a building science problem in a house, it's the same thing. What's, what's the problem? And, and here you go. This, this, is, this is what I, I, I bet is a very good parallel. People that come to you like the engine won't start. Well, you have your checklist. Uh, did you do this? Did you check this? Did you check that? Well, you right. don't check number three until you check number one and two. Right. So it's the same with a building. If you see mold on the wall, it's like, OK, right away. I know it's a moisture problem because I can't have mold without moisture. So I'm I'm searching for how did I get moisture on that wall? Is it a water leak? Is it condensation? What's driving that? So it's the same with you know, a motor not starting. And, and I think that goes back to, again, the, the, what you were talking about science being that process, right? If you understand the process of science, you can apply it to fixing a car, diagnosing a building or building a building because the process is the same. And the, and the, the, the method of inquiry is the same. It's just being applied in a different you know, industry with just different materials and, you know, different things, if you will. It's a car engine instead of the boiler in the house. But that boiler in the house works just like the car engine. It needs a certain type of fuel, right? Mm -hmm. It mixes with some air. It yep. combusts and blows up. You need to exhaust the bad stuff. You get a heat transfer out of the system. Mm -hmm. So the science is all pretty much the same. It's just being applied differently. And, and the beauty of, you know, when the student says, how do I get rich? It's understand the process so that you can gain enough knowledge to alter the process. And the people that alter the process are the people that get rich. Mm. Right? Like Tesla. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. He altered the process of driving a car or a rocket ship or roof shingles and solar panels, battery storage. How do I store energy? Mm. I can get it from the sun and I can put it in this battery in my basement and then I can use it when I need to. Yeah. Right. He changed the process. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if the idea is to go and you're in a car the go doesn't care whether you made it from burning gas or from uh you know storage and batteries and you know i even with the lawnmower engines sometimes we run them on uh, alcohol and uh the kids say how can you put alcohol in here i said the engine doesn't care no. it just needs fuel and you got to mix that fuel with air and you got to spark it at the right time and that's it you know it doesn't mm -hmm. care and there's a parallel co course with building. When you're diagnosing a building, people say, oh, but that's the roof, not the wall. Do you really think Mother Nature gives a damn whether it's a roof, wall, or floor? Mother Nature don't care, right? She has a certain set of rules that, you know, I to, for this to happen, these are the things that need to exist for that to happen. And that's what happens. That's how you get a leak. You have a force, you have a hole, and you have water. You get a leak. If I eliminate any one of those three, I don't get a leak. Nobody I like it. Whether it's the floor or wall, she doesn't. She just rains on the building. The water yeah. goes where the forces take it, right? Her, her the she sets up a, a certain set of rules, just like you said. You blow something up, it moves a piston and it moves the car. Right. Engine doesn't care what mode of explosion it got. Mm-hmm. Cool. I, I, 
if you want to get rich, you figure out how to take that mode of explosion and don't use a hundred hundred dollar barrel of oil, use something else that costs five bucks. And then you sell it to millions of people and you get very rich. Yeah, thanks guys. Steve, thanks for jumping on. I gotta go go yeah, make no sure problem. the kids are Mark, better. Mark texted me and said, Hey, come on, and then he bails. I know, right? Yeah. Matt, real quick, what's yep. the next piece of the uh house? What are you doing? So we'll be putting on um, our zip nine panels, uh, which is our exterior, will be our continuous exterior foam uh, insulation, sorry, that'll go all the way around the house, which we'll also have our WRB and also air sealing details. So we'll be seeing that starting, hope, should be tomorrow. And once that all gets on, trusses go up and then we'll, we'll kind of uh, start, then there'll be some air sealing details that comes into um, the ceiling lid and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, next, Next week, especially early on, will be our exterior insulation. That's awesome. I got to come out there and check it out here sometime in the near future. There. Heck yeah. Heck I yeah. I can't believe how fast it's going. Like, I, I, I feel like you guys just dug the ground a minute ago. Yeah. This part, this part's the fast part. Um, once, once the frame, once we get through framing, things start kind of slowing down once you get into wiring and plumbing and, uh kind of those things but uh yeah this this part's the fun fast part where you get to see a lot of progress real quick which is great because uh winter's going to be creeping up on us soon so we want to get shelled in so yeah cool but, all right guys well i got a roll okay you take care Thanks of the kiddos great talking see you guys all later all right all right we'll wrap it up it's pretty late uh steve i really appreciate you coming on the show and this is so exciting to watch time, the build this thing you know Always exciting. Thank you. Cool. Chat for All right. Later. Shop class podcast. Good night. This is a uh, pretty, we had a double episode tonight. That was pretty cool. All yeah. right, Steve. Thanks a lot. Duke. Thanks for joining. Thank Nick. Yeah. Right. Great evening. I'll see you That's guys next week. All righty. Okay. Bye. Bye.